As promised, we're back. We want to give thanks to everyone that's supporting the channel. Remember, like, subscribe and share. As we promised, we're going to be answering your questions every week. And from next week, the questions that get answered first are going to be the most liked. Because you know we get hundreds of questions and we can't address everyone. So the most liked ones are the ones we're going to start to answer from next week. But this week, we're going to answer as many as we can from the comments. All right. So, oh, the other thing is, if you do want to support us, donate to the channel. Um, or to our PayPal account, which is all in the comments, because that helps us to support the causes that we feel passionate about. All right, so the first question, um, the Bible is often both referenced and corrected of misinterpreted teachings and misinformation. Is there a more complete and or accurate account of this book? Yes. Um, the master teacher, Panda Babianun, Dr. Malachi Ziyo, put out a book called The Holy Tablets. You can actually Google The Holy Tablets and it's online because um, it's very hard to get hold of at the moment. But that book is basically giving you all the scriptures in one book translated properly for you. So all the stories that the Bible, the Quran, the Injil were trying to convey, you can find that in that book called The Holy Tablets. But even before the Holy Tablets, what we're saying is that these books are copies from ancient tablets. So when we deal with the Bible, you're dealing with the Enuma Elish, the Gilgamesh epic, the Astrohasis, the Gilgamesh epics, and lots of tablets known as the Akkadian tablets. Okay, so that forms the Bible. And then when you look at other scriptures like the Quran, um, a lot of the writings in the Quran are already in the Old Testament and the New Testament. So when you say is there a more authentic book, the, the tablets will be where they're coming from. Okay, um, so yeah, I hope that's answered that question. Um, is there a more complete and accurate account of this book? Yeah, I've already answered that. Second question, what is the significance of the planet risk? And how can the master do teacher, Dr. Malachi, your claim to be from there, yet living as an earth being. Again, this is a question we answer many, many, many times. When we say he's from planet risk, we're not talking about the physical body, we're talking about the being known as Yanun. Now, a lot of people talk about ancestral worship or when you die, you go to heaven or you go to hell. Now, if people claim both in the religious world that there are other places where beings go to or where we go to, where is that? They say heaven, but as we've mentioned many times in the scriptures, when you look up the word heaven and what they're talking about is Oranos. Oranos in the Greek is dealing with the Orion star constellation. OK, so there are many planets, many beings that exist out of the physical body form. So the planet risk is where the Riskians come from. And Yanun is a Riskian. And Yanun is the spiritual guide of Dr. Malachi Z. York. So when we say the physical person, he's just like you and me. And you also have a spiritual counterpart that's not from here. Of course, you may not remember where you're from. And so this is part of your spiritual growth to learn to know who um, you are in your spiritual essence. OK, and I've mentioned many times that other beings, whether it be Jesus, Muhammad, Martin, Martin, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, um, Gandhi, you can name all the spiritual teachers that have come to the planet, whether it's Buddha, they all had a physical body and they taught about, you know, going back to where they come spiritually. So Yanun, in the personage of Dr. Malachi Z. York, is the being that comes from Risk. And Risk is a place in Ilion, okay? So... He gives you all the information about this planet. And if you didn't come from there, how would you be able to tell and give people information consistently in all the books you've ever written, over a thousand books, and nothing changes? The, the information is exactly the same and is consistent. He's actually written a book called Risk and Ilion, yeah, which you can get from us and you can get more information on that. How to pray and who to pray to and does it have an effect on our reality? Yes, um, the, the way you pray, you have to understand what praying, praying is. Praying is communicating to some 
deity or some being or someone. The thing is, in the religious world, they teach you that you're praying to God. We've broken down who and what God is. The different extraterrestrials, they call them different names, like the Elohim, Yahweh, um, Adonai, you know, we can go, the list goes on and on and on. What we're telling you is that these are actual beings, like Enki, Enlil, these are beings that um, basically are addressed in the Bible. So when you're praying, you're praying to these people. And we've also explained that pray, P-R-E-Y, is different from pray, P-R-A-Y. Now, the prayer system comes from ancient, the ancient Egyptian system of prayer, known as Taful, okay, where basically you look on the walls of Egypt, you see people raising their hands to the sun, you see them bowing and stuff like that, but it was not praying to the sun, it was given reverence because they understood that without the sun, life form on the planet will cease to exist. Everyone on the planet depends on the sun, is dependent on the sun. So we're just saying that the prayer system came out of ancient Egypt. Um, you can literally see all the positions in Islam of the prayer system. And again, we have this in our book. If you seek out the book called uh, the Taful, um, you know, it explains about prayer and where it comes from. All right. And uh, what's the second part of that? Does it have an effect? Yes, it does, because it's energy that you're channeling. It's just like when you concentrate mentally on something, you can manifest that. So when you speak into your ancestors, this is what we're doing really, we're connecting with our ancestors and speaking with them, asking them for guidance and for help. The thing is you have both agreeable or disagreeable ancestors. So people say good and bad. So you have beings that influence you negatively and you have those that influence you positively. So um, prayer is the art of talking and not listening. Yeah, because people, when they pray, they're generally talking to God and asking, can you help me with this? Can you do this? Can I get that? And we say meditation is the art of not talking, but listening. Because when you send a message to someone, they have to respond for you to receive it. And if you listen carefully, you will hear the response from your voices in your head, which we've explained as well, that you have a radio in your head and you're transmitting information, whether it's mental thoughts, or physically speaking sound, which resonates and it gets sent and you can receive affirmation or you get back a response. And so if you are praying to the right channel, like if you tune your radio to the right frequency, you get through. You know, a walkie-talkie, for example, you're trying to speak to someone, you have to tune your walkie-talkie to the right station for that person to receive you. And then you should receive a response and you will know when the thing you're trying to ask for or achieve, you, you get to do. Or you might get information that leads you to getting the answer. So, yes, prayer does work. Um, you, can, you can heal people like by praying for them. So someone could be in hospital um, and a group of you can pray and send them that energy that will heal them. So prayer does work. But what we're saying is be careful that you're not just calling on negative or disagreeable entities that are not really there to help you. So you're now channeling your energy to them instead of the, the right ones. Um, I visited Dr. York's son's house with some friends in Ghana. Very informative material, books. Yes, so we are all over the world. And I'm pretty sure you're refer to, referring to Duswa, one of our brothers who is in Ghana and has been there for a while. And when we say that we're worldwide, we literally are. So... We're doing things in Ghana, we're in Liberia, we're in Nigeria, we're, we're all over the world. So, yes, it's good that you visited his house and that actually helps listeners and prove that what we're saying is true, that we are worldwide. And he's probably got a lot of books as well that, you know, some people may never have come um, seen. And it's actually interesting because I'm interviewing him tomorrow <laughs> on our radio show because he's going to be um, talking about reparations and nation building because that's something that he's very, very informative on. So it's good that you're saying you, you visited Dr. York's son um, in Ghana with some friends and he gave you some good material. Okay, um, I want to know more about the Dogons and their connection with Egypt and also the language because um, I somehow feel it's kind of connected to the Sama language. I think they mean, I don't know if they mean Sumerian. Um, they have significant similarities. 
Oh, some of these you have to read more to see the rest of the question. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, it's not expanding, but I get the gist of the question. So, right, the Dogons are more connected with Sirius A, B and C. Um, because, like we said, they're different extraterrestrials that came here onto the planet and landed in certain parts of the world. Okay, so the Natharu would be our ancestors. They came and they were in Africa. Um, and there's different parts of Africa. So the Dogons are descendants of these ancestors. But you also had beings that went to like Bali in India from Nirvana. You got the um, Anunnaki that came. You've got Syrians that came from, um, or, you know, the Orion constellation. So um, different beings came here and ger like basically germinated or mixed their seed with beings that were already on the planet. So the Dogons, um, obviously people talk about Mali and they talk about Mansa Musa and, you know, how, how great these people were. Um, what's the, the language? The language we keep explaining is Misbatia or Nuapik, which is the first language on the planet. That's why all the other languages have similarities. You will find certain words in our language that have been borrowed into Islam, into, you know, Judaism, into different languages. So if you go back to the original, you will see where the, um, the, the, the branches came from. And this language is the same language that you find written on the pyramids as hieroglyphics. Okay, but that was a pictorial language. Yeah? And then you have the same in Sumeria, because you mentioned Suma, um, and that's known as cuneiform. But they're scripts, because when you ask people what is the spoken language of cuneiform or cuneiform or even hieroglyphics, people will say um, it's metuneta, right? The metuneta or the metunetir or neteru or natharu is dealing with those, the scripts that the language misbatia was written in. But over time, you've got people that borrowed this language and you see um, the Chinese script comes from it. There are many different Arabic scripts that have come from it. Um, basically, every language on the planet comes from it. That's why you will see similarities. We've got a book called The Language. Um, um, it's called Paz Shalid, the, the Language. I can't remember the full title, but it's a, it's a language book. Um, we have many languages book, language books that talk about our language and where, it come, where all the other languages come from. In fact, I will show it to you um, later on. Um, was the other? Yeah, we covered that. Let's keep going. Thank you for all you do. Thank you. Without you guys um, supporting and listening and tuning into the channel and subscribing, you know, we won't be able to do this. So keep subscribing, sharing and, uh, you know, supporting. Do some of these extraterrestrials have sense of humour and sarcasm or is this something only with us humans? Yes, some do. Um, some don't. Because some of them don't have emotions. Like most of the ones that people see, like the greys, there's different species of greys. There's the Rumadians, there's the Maccabians, there are different types of um, extraterrestrials. And the ones that don't have feelings, like the greys, which are the ones that most people see with the big eyes and you know the big heads, they were, a lot of them were hybrids because the reptilians were actually abducting them and creating different hybrids, mixing, you know, genes. And so they don't have emotions. This is what they do. They try to find out what makes humans different and why do humans act and behave in the way they do. So they do a lot of experiments. Um, you know, they abduct humans, put them on, you know, what their people say they were abducted, put on a bed, they were cut up. They insert little um, chips in people so they can monitor them and study them. But yeah, they're trying to figure out emotions. Um, that's why they, when they cut you and do certain things to you, because they don't feel, you wonder why they don't seem to show any, any emotions because they don't have any. And in terms of sense of humour, yes, you do have some species of extraterrestrials that have sense of humour. We are extraterrestrials, as we've broken down before, and we have a sense of humour. So whatever you have, you're genetically linked to the extraterrestrials that you evolved from. And this is what we're saying, that the Natharu who are the original where every um, DNA on the planet ends up coming from because even the beings that came down, they had to take something that was already here, evolving, 
And this is how they created primitive worker known as the Lulu Amilu. And then other extraterrestrials also came in and they basically take those genes to evolve and, you know, um, create other hybrids. Yeah, they do have a sense of humour. Sense of humour is necessary sometimes because uh, the world can get a bit serious and heavy. Um, yeah, the sarcasm is, is, is another, um, that goes to the Greeks. Um, funnily, the word um, relates to money because monet is um, a derivative of the word money and it's an ancient Egyptian, um, ancient Greek god um, of sarcasm. This is why money is used as a tool because if you really think about it, money makes life unfair because you can have one person who's got billions in their bank account and then you have other people that have nothing. You can have one person who has a mansion with a lot of bedrooms, you know, 20, 50, 100 bedrooms and people are homeless. So that is a form of sarcasm and a form of laughing at you because money is not really, it's a construct that's been created to give those who have the opportunities and those who don't, they kind of get stuck because they feel they can't do anything without money. So in a, in a way, that's not fair. Whereas you could actually create a system where instead of one person having billions and others not having, it could be spread out evenly. Everybody will have something and we live more har in, harmonious, um, in a harmonious way. All right, let's keep going. Um, what's the best herb to cleanse our bodies? My mum is battling cancer and from what the doctors are saying, it's getting aggressive and spreading. This is why we explain about a healthy lifestyle, um, an alkaline diet as opposed to an acidic one, being in nature, cleansing yourself, learning how to do certain chants because really frequencies can cure certain ailments like you can cure cancers and certain things with frequency but this is science that is not well known or it's only becoming more popular so unfortunately with cancers there are you know different stages um, and once the cancer starts to attack the cells and spread it makes it harder to combat but having said that we've known people that have been able been able to revert um, just, the, you know, the healthy diet is so important. Eating grapes, yeah, preferably the ones with seeds. Eat as many grapes as you can. Um, there's many herbs. Cleansing is to try and remove all the mucus from your body, remove the metals from your body. We have many products in the store, nashat.co.uk, that will help you with this. Do a colon cleanse because, as I've explained in previous videos, this takes time it's not things don't just happen overnight so what you have to do is eliminate all the toxins and all the things that become cancers later on um, so what we would say is you can get a, a biometric um, analysis or get like get diagnosed with equipment that will tell you how far and how bad things are and then use herbs to combat them um, we're not medical doctors, so we're not going to give you any medical advice. You need to obviously speak to your, your practitioner. And, um, but yeah, there are natural herbalists that have cured and deal with curing cancer. Contact us and we can maybe refer you to, to some people. Okay. Um, yeah, when the doctor's saying it's getting aggressive, um, again, like we say, it's about knowing what to do. Everything really is cellular. Once you get to the cell and you basically regenerate new cells, then the ones that you're losing or that are dying can be removed and then you'll be fine. You know, so um, it gets aggressive when you don't do anything about it and it starts to spread. Would you say love is the only truth, but because we have labeled, categorized, set boundaries, validations, conditions, departmentalized, compartmentalize etc as defining love yes uh, excellent point and you will hear a lot of people say love is the answer which is true but at the same time because I, we, we keep explaining that there are people that are have sinister objectives and the word love has been desecrated and this is why when you spell it backwards you get evil yeah like 
if you look at the word L-O-V-E, if you go E-V-O-L, it actually spells evil phonetically. Because remember, I keep explaining that the, um, the vowels can be interchangeable. So the O can be changed to an I. So you can see the word evil, the same thing I did with Christian and Antichrist, um, is that really you have to now replace the word love with the word care. True love is divine, divine love, right? And in our language, we call that ashuk, which is it's love that is, um, you can't really put it into words per se because it's unconditional. Like, you don't love someone or something because of what you can get from it. Whereas the way love has been desecrated at the moment is that if I, if, when people say, I love you, there's always a because. I love you because you're pretty. I love you because you're my wife. I love you because you do this for me. You know, so it gets turned into something where it's, you're giving something to get something. And this is why the whole Valentine's Day it's, it's a, a, a marketing thing and it becomes something that people are following instructions like, oh, I have to give you flowers, I have to give you chocolates, I have to do certain things for you to, to show that I love you. But really, you should be doing that anyway. This is why divine love is unconditional. So yes, love transcends people, places and things, but that's the genuine, sincere love, not the lustful love, not the love because I want something from you. I love you because you're my mum, because you cook or you clean for me. No, you has got to be unconditional. And the best example of unconditional love is someone who's willing to sacrifice everything for you, like Dr. York, like the great teachers that would be like, you know what, for the sake of love and unity, I will starve myself, like in the case of Gandhi, you know, people that will say, look, let's come together regardless of the races, the people, places and things, let's come together and unite for the sake of love. Because we know ultimately, if everybody got along and, you know, we work together, the world would be a much better place. But unfortunately, there are greedy people, there are people who want more for themselves than everyone else, there are people who use racism to make themselves feel like they're better than other people, and then when you pull them up or you teach on racism and you start to deal with races, as in the same people that are teaching racism, if you say, but, you know, when we deal with black people or what people call black people, and we start to say, well, we were here first, then it's like, you're racist. No, we're not racist. The facts remain the facts. But you're right. If we could really love, as in divine love, which a lot of people are doing, and that's when you have unconditional love, for the planet, for the animals, for the people, for the different races, you know. Um, that's why the universal language that most of the people, the prophets and people that came to help, they say, love yourself as you love thy neighbour. You know, and that's, that's a universal thing. It's not about, you know, do, do unto others as you would like done to you. These, these are universal languages based on love. So that's an excellent um, question. Divine love will definitely um, bring us together. Um, thanks very much for, the, for this wonderful opportunity. In one of my videos, I viewed, one of your videos, I viewed, I heard you say that men should eat red fruit. I was wondering what um, could this meal, what kind of meal? Can you explain more? Okay, um, again, I have to always remind people, I'm a student teacher of the master teacher, Dr. Malachi Z. York, and he gave us an update where he was saying that, um, just to kind of make, excuse me, just to make it simple, he said, men should eat red, red things, you know, like um, red fruits, um, and women should eat green things. Not to say you can't eat, either or, but he just said that um, red, um, like, um, I'm trying to think, cranberry, um, there's certain things that are red in colour, those are more conducive for men, and the green stuff is for women, however, you can eat healthily, um, so that's what I was making reference to when I said about the red, um, and that was just based on an update that he came, uh, he gave us, um, but also there are people that are land creatures, 
and they're people that are sea creatures, meaning that people of the sea would more eat like seafood, um, and then people on land would eat more land food. But because we're mixed so much nowadays, you have to determine for yourself, like, okay, what am I? Am I more of a seafood person or am I a land food person? And then the best way of eradicating all the confusion, if you don't know, is to just like stick to fruit and veg and healthy things so that um, you're more, your body's more alkaline because diseases cannot thrive in an alkaline state, you know? And um, it's like if things are meant to be in the freezer, they will go off if they're not in the freezer. So if your body is more alkaline, diseases can't really thrive in there. But when it's acidic, and this is the environment that they like, and bacteria and certain diseases, they thrive in that environment, you know? So if you took meat or stuff that's not meant to be put outside, and it's meant to be in the fridge, you leave it outside, it's gonna rot and it's gonna go off, all right? So it's the same thing with your body when you're putting things into your body. You have to put things that are going to be conducive to the environment of your body, you know, because um, you have more water, more liquids in your body than, you know, um, anything else. So you have to remember that, you know, if you're feeding your body, feed it with watery stuff, you know, cucumbers, fruits, basically, cucumbers, um, watermelons, anything wa watery is going to be much better for you than flesh which is dead carcass and it's going to take a long time to digest and this is where a lot of the cancers and the metals and the things that come from years and years and years of accumulation of the wrong stuff you know so you have to cleanse regularly you know we talk about doing a colon cleanse a colon basically when you eat things they get um there's like a residue and things that build up and you have to cleanse regularly to get your body to be you know, rid of these, these um, pesticides and, you know, you have a lot of parasites. Some are good for you, some are bad for you. So you have to always kind of do a maintenance, all right? Um, what is wool sabat rooted in? What to eat to not to be eaten? Okay. Wool sabat is the root. So wool sabat is not rooted in anything as such other than the fact that it goes beyond the stars, right, from our ancestors who came to this planet. And there are many planets, not just in our solar system, but in the cosmos. And there are different life forms. The environment in which you're in will determine the type of life form you have. So um, if you were living in an environment that was really, really, really hot, you know, you're going to grow a certain way just like you can't grow certain um, fruits and certain things in different climates so you have to grow them in the climate that it's most conducive for so Wu Sabat is the original culture on the planet so when you talk about the ancient Egyptians that's what they actually practiced um, and when you say ancient Egyptians you go to Egypt the word um, Egypt is known by many many names Egypt comes from Egyptos or Egyptos, which basically was describing an incident that people that were going into that land, um, which is known like Napatar, it's known by Moreau, um, the Nile Valley, you know, this is where the original beings resided and that culture then spread across the world to different places and other people came to Egypt, like the Phoenicians and um, you know, you have people like the Greeks, the Roman, they all came to Egypt and learned and took the culture back to this, um, to, to, you know, to Europe and started to teach a lot of things that they got from ancient Egypt. Even biblically, everybody goes to Egypt. Moses went to Egypt, Jesus went to Egypt, Joseph went to Egypt, um, everyone went to Egypt. And that's the root where every culture got their information and civilization from. Then you have obviously like the Sumerians, who the Anunnaki came and they were like in Mesopotamia and you know from that region you, you have beings that went to Bali in India as I said before like they, the different beings that came afterwards to the planet once people knew about the planet a lot of beings wanted to come here some came here for holidays some came here to hunt some came here for shopping you know some came here to to try and get gold and certain things that were only here 
Now, people will say, why is this planet so special? Because you have to remember that the planets in our solar system came from another planet, which I've explained before, known as Sal, or, or from the Milky Way. And then the Milky Way came from this planet called um, Sal. So when something blows up, right, as, as that sun did, uh, the pieces of it got sent to a distance. And as far as they could go, they got caught up in the magnetic pull of the sun. And so each piece may have had certain minerals and certain things that evolved from the original where it broke off from. So on our planet, you know, we have a, a lot. When it cooled down, the waters um, basically made the planet more of a sea planet. And so there was an Aquarian life first. So there's lots of evolution in terms of the different species in the seas and then you had the, the gold and you know the platinum and certain things that took millions of years to evolve so people will go to different planets seeking certain minerals certain you know certain things and this is why even now you hear they're telling you that the asteroid belt is being mined by people like Elon Musk because they're finding that you know they have certain um valuable minerals and things there so this is why but yes yeah, so um Wusabat is rooted as the original culture on the planet you say in terms of what to eat what to eat uh, we keep getting this question a lot but eat fruit and veg um eat watery foods eat things that are going to give you an alkaline state not an acidic state don't eat dead things dead things I mean, we're all evolving and it's a work in progress. You're not going to just click your fingers and everything will be gone overnight, especially if you've been doing it for many, many years and your parents were doing it and their parents were doing it. So when you start to research and study and find out what causes diseases, what causes certain illnesses, we have a part of that called diagnosis of the races, which will give you in terms of diet. So for example, when you look at a race, you look at the elder, see what they're dying from, it will tell you what they've been eating all their life. So if you look at the Chinese, for example, they eat a lot of rice, right? Black people also started to eat a lot of rice. Rice can be basically uh, it's sugar, right? Because of the, the glucose, because the starch turns to glucose and the glucose is sugar. Too much sugar, sugar is not good for you. Sugar rottens your teeth. Um, sugar, you can get things, natural sugar in fruits. So you don't actually need processed sugar. It's the same with everything that's white, white flour, white bread. So eliminate all the processed stuff because when you process stuff, you take out all the nutrients and the good stuff from it, it just becomes white. So white rice is not good for you. But the point being that you can look at the elders in any race and see what they suffer with, you know, high blood pressure, um, you know, diabetes. Um, I'm talking about when you look at some of the races, right? So if you know that people are going to suffer with diabetes, diabetes is really caused by sugar a lot of the time. So you would say, okay, my grandma was suffering from diabetes. Let me cut out sugar. Salt is another one. And that's why everything you eat has too much salt and sugar. And you're trained from a young age, from a, a baby to like sweet things. So most people don't like bitters and they don't like to take things that don't taste sweet. And um, so you're trained to eat sugar and salt. Sugar and salt is more of an, a, a pandemic than, you know, cancers, for example. So you have to learn from an early age what you put into your body, like it's the fuel that basically runs your body. So reiterate, if you can't eradicate processed things immediately, wean yourself off. Don't eat the red meat, don't eat meat, don't eat dead things because dead things, um, all they do is give you protein at the end of the day. But at the same time, you can find other source of protein. People say, if I don't eat meat, I'm going to be skinny. But you look at the largest mammals on the planet, you know, like elephants, you know, they, they don't, they, they're vegetarian. You can go and look at the biggest animals on the planet. They, they're vegetarian. So it's a matter of having a balanced diet, knowing what to eat and what you can supplement and, and stay away from dairy products. Dairy products produce a lot of mucus, 
uh, mucus, as Dr. Sebi and many others have said, mucus is not good for you. That's very acidic, so you have to eliminate mucus because the mucus traps a lot of the parasites, a lot of the metals, which eventually evolve into cancers and so on. So to just answer that question, eat fruit and veg, eat alkaline things, drink lots of water. If you're male, eat lots of red stuff. If you're female, eat lots of green stuff. You can both eat either or. So we're not telling you to stop eating green things if you're a man, but we're just saying that it's more conducive for you. Um, yeah, and it's not just about the eating, it's also about the fasting and not eating. You know, like there's, there's music where you have actual notes and then you have rest. In life is the same, you don't eat all the time. There's times when you should stop eating so that you can eliminate. Fasting is a good way of eliminating toxins from your body. So stop eating from time to time. Fast every month, every few days, you know, that helps to cleanse. And if you fast for long periods and just drink water, that will cleanse your body. Dr. Sebi and people who have actually been known for dealing with health matters tell you this. This is not only from us. Health is universal. All right. Okay. Um, what's your take on African black man's hair? With everything, I know people say, what's your take? It's really not about my take. It's about the facts. And this is why we put out information so people can do research. The actual facts are there. A fact is a fact. Now, there may be differences in opinion and people will say, I think this, I think that. But when you research things, you find out that a lot of the times when people are in agreement is because there's no more opinions. It's based on facts. So when you're dealing with the hair, African hair, again, um, we've said many times, every race on the planet has something that's unique to them, a unique feature. So when you say the African man's hair, yes, we have hair and that we are the only race. That's what makes us unique. This is why before everybody was perming and pressing their hair and, you know, trying to straighten it, our hair was woolly or more what people would say afros. And you would see black people with afros back in the 60s, 70s. And that would because that's what made you stand out. The hair is an antenna which picks up energy from the sun. And this is why, you know, it grows and curls in the number nine, because the number nine is the highest number, as we've explained in previous videos. But the thing is that um, the hair grows from inside of your head and not outside. So if you don't have any hair, it doesn't mean that you're not receiving. It's just that you're receiving it, but it's more internal. And so um, people that destroy their hair, they don't, it's not as potent in terms of as an antenna to receive the information from the sun, but it's still, you still have the capability. So don't damage your hair because in putting the chemicals in your hair, it seeps through into your head. And this is where the problem is. So um, all these chemicals that you know, burn your head and your scalp and so on, it's, it's gonna affect your internal which then affects your mind, all right? So yeah, the, the hair, the black man's hair based on the question or the African black man's hair is, is unique, but it's, it's not like, and another thing, because they, they, the, um, the ego and vanity comes into play where you have people thinking, I'm gonna grow my hair so long, I'm never gonna cut my hair, like, you know, certain people, because they believe that the power of the hair, they don't wanna cut their hair, but, you have to remember there's different levels of elevation, meaning when you transcend people, places and things, that means you, you're, you're not dealing with your physical anymore, you're dealing with your higher consciousness, then your hair is going to not really matter in that situation because eventually you're going to die and leave your hair anyway. So you might as well focus on the internal or the spiritual aspect of you. Um, so if you're bored or if you cut your hair off, you're not going to lose your power, um, as you know people believe because of the whole, um, so, is it Solomon, I always get it wrong, Shamsun, that's it. <laughs> Shamsun's, um, that whole story of him getting his hair cut. But, but Samson relates to the sun because Shamsun, you can actually hear it um, related to the, to the sun. So yes, your, your hair is important, but keep it natural. And if you don't have it, um, you're, you're still gonna be okay. Is there such a thing as a new soul? 
Yes, there is such a thing as a new soul. And this is important because when you teach what people call esoteric knowledge or information dealing with the soul, the spirit, and not it's not um, only in a religious manner, right? Religion does teach about spirit and soul. However, this is energy we're dealing with, right? So there are new energies that come to the planet and they're actually new children or new souls that have incarnated on the planet. And we've been taught that from the years um, 1973 to the year 2003, all the newborns were new souls. Yeah, and some of them are known as golden children. So from 1970 um, to, to now, there were, there were new, new souls. But from um, 1973 to the year 2003, there were actual golden children. And some of these have been, um, because they don't know and they haven't got someone to teach them about who they are and their powers and their abilities, they end up in like, in the entertainment world. Um, and then you also have what we call um, star children, yeah, who are also born. So there's always agreeable and disagreeable. So they, a lot of them get confused and they end up in the musical industry, um, the music industry, and um, a lot of them are very talented. They like to be alone. Some people can't really deal with the world. You know, they're very different. Um, and then you have indigo children and there's so much going on on this planet that, um, yes, so to answer the question, new souls, were born and um, uh, yeah, there is such a thing as a new soul. Hi y'all, I hope you're having a great day. I've been very blessed and gifted these past couple of years, but I've also witnessed a lot of envy sent my way, dealt with poor yet prideful. Yeah, this is what happens. Um, you heard of the, the term um, crabs in a barrel. When, and the, another one is misery loves company. Um, meaning some people that don't want to elevate, don't want to put in the work, or if, if it's not in them to do so, if they see somebody else doing it, or kind of, like you say, coming out of the, the barrel, they, they try to pull you back down, or they become envious or prideful, and sometimes you may be a chosen one. And your aura, your energy, especially when you start to put in this work of transformation, um, your energy field, your aura, your, you, start to, you start to vibrate differently. So when you go in an environment that is, let's say, negative, you stand out, do you know what I mean? So when you stand out and you start to achieve things, you start to utilise your powers and abilities to do things that others can't do or haven't put in the work to do, they can become envious of you because they say, oh, you think you're special. You're, you don't think you're special, you're just living your purpose and doing what you do. And, you know, success in, in itself, people make success so unattainable because what they tell you success or push uh, mass media to tell you success, it's, you know, materialistic things. You know, the more money you have, the, the cars you have, the houses you have, the jewelry, the jewelry you have, you know, now it's even more superficial with social media, like the more likes you have, um, people could be miserable, but they can put out a picture, use the filters and everything and make themselves look good and get a lot of likes. But deep down, they may not be happy. They may not really be living their purpose. So when you are, you do stand out and it is about elevating. Um, some are going up and some are going down. You have people who may have had everything and then they let their ego, their pride, or what we call the, the nine mental diseases, get to them, where they're not using what they've been gifted with to help others, to help humanity, to, you know what I mean, teach truth, to spread information, um, health, wealth, everything, you know, so they fall down. And that teaches them a lesson, because when you had it all, you actually didn't help anybody. And then you have those who have nothing, and they're doing their best helping people and progressing and then they become successful. So we're living in a day and time where the people that had all the success and didn't really use it in a way that was for the benefit of humanity, it was based around greed, based around controlling everyone. They're finding now that people are waking up and not, they're not able to control people anymore. So they're losing power and the materialistic world is kind of fading because 
people are going back to live in nature. They're not buying and eating crap. So those industries and the businesses that were built on people being fed crap to make your health bad, then you end up in a hospital. And then, you know, we say a hospital is somewhere you're being hospitable, people are being hospitable to you, then you end up sick, then you end up dying or having mental health issues based on that lifestyle. When you change your lifestyle and start to live a more righteous lifestyle, a more helpful lifestyle, a more loving, a more caring lifestyle, then you start to progress and then your ancestors start connecting with your ancestors on the other side. They will help you and work with you to basically, yeah, help you be the best you can and to um, tap into your, your hidden potential. So yeah, we're getting some really good questions. Um, can you go more into detail about being black African American with RH negative blood type? Specifically, what does that mean for me here on earth? Um, okay, the, again, it's all about knowledge, right? These terms, black, African American, these are constructs um, because race or the racist um, world is, dealt, is be, it's basically based on saying you're black, you're white, you're, but then, you know, then when you say what makes a person black, the DNA, and you say what makes a person white, if a person has one drop of black blood in them, they're actually black, according to how, you know, when you go back to the, the, the so-called Aryan race and who defines white. Um, and none of those terms even apply to us, because when you look at yourself, you're not even black. This is black. If you look at my skin and compare it to the black I'm wearing, I'm not black, I'm brown. And if you look at what people are calling white, it's completely different to what the colour of the skin is. So it really deals with your DNA and your genetics. Um, we, we call ourselves Nuwapians, and there's a reason for that, because the word noob, um, the root word of Nuwapian is noob, which relates to gold. And we're talking about gold has different forms, right? So there's liquid gold, for example. We're talking about the gold within your system. So we didn't even really use the word black. Black is more of a state. Um, the state before light existed, we call that supreme balancement, okay? So the terms black don't really relate to people, even though we know that um, it's a construct that was designed to label people on the planet. Um, the word African doesn't really relate to us. Um, again, because that comes from when the slavery was taking place with the Arabs, with the Europeans, and from the word Farqa or Afrikia, which means to subdivide. This is why we always go back to Nuwapians, right? We are Nuwapians. And so um, the other part of the question was African-American, right? So when you're called an African-American, which part of you is African and which part of you is American? You see, these, these are literally games that are being played. Your DNA is what makes you who you are. And so um, we know for lower level information, we will use terms like African and, and you know, but really we're Nuwapians, which, which relates to who you really are genetically. Um, and um, RH negative, yeah. So again, positive, the, the African original um, blood types were positive. The, the negative came in when extraterrestrials came and started to mix the extraterrestrial DNA with the African. And then the, the bloodlines of, say, the people that run in the world, if you do the research, you find like all the presidents are related in some way, shape or form by blood because the people that control and, and rule the world, they try to keep that within their bloodline. So that's where you find most of them are RH, RH negative. But of course, now we're mixed. Many people have been mixed because, you know, over the generations people are mixed. So you now find people with different types of blood types, negatives as well. So that's where it comes from. Um, I mean, it, what does it mean specific, specifically? It, it doesn't um, mean much except that, obviously, when you're mating or getting with somebody for, say, having offspring, it's important to know your blood types so that the offspring you're producing is not going to have any ailments because of incompatibilities in blood types. It's important to know your blood type because 
you may be in an accident or something and you need blood or you need body parts and they need to know who's compatible with you because if you put, um, or like when, when people get um, sickle cell, you know, these, these are things that relate to the blood type. So you want to make sure that the person you're with is not going to produce a baby or a child that's going to have sickle cell or have some other ailment. So it's good to know the blood types for many, many reasons. So that's why when you say, what does that mean for you on earth? It means, you know, be aware, know who you are, know your genetics, know what blood type you are in case you ever need assistance or help that you get compatible blood type. But as far as being negative doesn't mean you're a negative person, you know, it's the negative and positive is in everyone because you have both agreeable and disagreeable within you. Um, and this is why certain doctrines don't work where people like the Christians teach you to, you know, be good all the time. You can't be good all the time, you know, turn the other cheek. That type of doctrine will never work because nobody can be good all the time and nobody can be bad all the time. It's about balance and being aware and being agreeable and then leaning more to your positive side as opposed to your negative side. If you feed your negative side, then that's the reptilian nature within you. The reptilian nature is aggressive. It eats, it likes, um, meat makes you more aggressive basically as well. Um, if you ever watch boxers or people that need aggression, they will tell you they eat, you know, lots of, dairy products, lots of meat, lots of things like that to give them the aggression. So, um, yeah, try to, to know your blood type for those reasons. What is your take on male circumcision? What is, what is it significant on spirituality, if any? That's such an excellent question because, again, these things you learn through the biblical scriptures, like circumcision from, you know what I mean, the covenant of Abraham. But the thing about this is, as we explain, the extraterrestrials that brought about circumcision, circumcision, they did that so that they could produce more food <laughs> because um, the sensitivity in that part of your body when you're having intercourse will make you ejaculate quicker, right? So, because it's more sensitive. And so a lot of religious groups by way of Abrahamic religions were taught to have circumcision as a part of being the covenant. However, um, that goes to the extraterrestrials who wanted to produce more children so they can have more food. So if you're not circumcised, taking away religion doesn't, it doesn't mean you're any less than somebody who is circumcised. The main thing about not being circumcised is you have to be hygiene that you know hygiene is important you have to be able to clean you know the foreskin pull it back clean yourself properly because you can contract dirt and diseases and certain things so yeah circumcision is not like other than the religious um you know sense of it it, it, it doesn't make that much of a difference um what is the significance on spirituality spirituality yeah so it doesn't have a significance on spirituality at all yeah, apart from what I've already explained. Can you help me to get something to improve my eyesight? I've been told I have glaucoma. Um, again, as we said, um, a lot of it goes down to mucus, right? There's mucus in your brain, in the membrane. So if you can eradicate the mucus, I wear glasses myself, because we damage our eyes with lights as well. Um, I mentioned the mucus because Dr. Sebi, who is again well known for being a health practitioner, he explained that he was losing his eyesight. And when he fasted, he fasted for a long period of time, um, his eyesight came back. It's, the, it's not even really the eyes that is the problem, um, because the eyes are just the cameras. It's, it's more to do with um, the nerves the nerve endings and things like that. So, like I said, if you look at how your, your brain works, you can have a lot of mucus in your head as well. So if you can eradicate the mucus, that's number one. Number two, in terms of herbs, um, there are many herbs. Um, I would say, yeah, seek, uh, you know, a herbalist, a natural herbalist, and they'll be able to also help you with that. 
we have to keep emphasizing we're not medical doctors, so don't go and do something, you know, and say we told you to do it because your health is really down to you. But of course, do the research. All right. Um, what was that question? Yeah. Also, stay away from. Uh, I'm an IT person. My background, anyway, is IT. So I have had a history of staring in front of computers all day long and. Now we've got mobile phones, so we're constantly getting the lights into our eye and those lights can be damaging to our eyes. So try as much as possible not to steer into a lot of bright white lights. Uh, check this out. During last week's eclipse, most of the time when the sun and the moon is out during the daytime, we can see the moon because science says the moon is reflecting. Uh, don't. Okay. Uh, reflecting the sunlight and so on. Okay, on the day of the eclipse, prior to the moon crossing over the sun, this is a long one, how come the moon wasn't visible like it would be any other day since being out of the daytime, etc.? And when it completely went across the face of the sun, it seemed to disappear out the sky how can this be possible and when has our moon turned black as well? Seems like we should be able to see the greyish colour, but it was all black. Um, please, I'd like the answer of this, Anthony from Dallas. That's a lot. Um, right, so the way the the way it works, right, so you have the planet and then you have the moon as a satellite of the planet and then obviously the planet rotating around the sun, right? So it's about perspective and angle. So like, so even though you're saying that the moon is actually smaller than the sun, so how can the moon cover the entire sun? So it's a matter of perspective, it's like, have you ever heard the riddle where people say, how can you put a camel through, um, a, you know, when you have a needle and you have the hoop and the needle, and they say, a, a, people say they can get a camel through that hoop, and they show you it. it's by the perspective. So what we're saying is that it's the angle that you're looking from and what that perspective is that will make things appear or look differently. So from a particular angle, it can look like you've put the camel through that little hoop on the needle. And it's the same when we're dealing with this, this whole eclipse thing. But I do get the question, the point that um, the moon is not actually transparent. So if you follow the fact that the moon is, say, like say this is the Earth and the moon is here and they're moving together. And then when the, um, let's, the sun is on this side. So when the... Um, when the moon is here, um, the sun is on that side, right? So you should only, this is the earth, you should only see the light of the sun that way. But when you rotate and it's like the other way, the, the perspective is going to change. And so depending on where you are and where you're looking at it from, it's going to appear differently. But that whole, because um, a lot of people don't even believe that there's such a thing as a moon in the sense that, you know, flat earth people say that they don't really accept and believe all of that. So, um, but I say it's a perspective and I know my flat earth people are going to come at me, but I, I keep saying this, like, you can't say one thing to say something is flat and then you say it has a dome. And then I say, is the dome separate from the flat earth? You say no, but it's attached to the earth. So then it's no longer flat because the dome is attached to it. And then I say, what's under the other side of the, uh, the flat surface? Even if you have mountains or things on the flat surface, it's no longer flat. I'm just saying that they may need to change that whole word of flat earth because you can't say it's flat and then there's things on top of it that give you a different perspective. But I'm sure, you know, there's going to be comments. But we'll see next week. We'll address those based on what comes up from this video. But um, yeah, I, I'm saying it's perspective. And um, the scientists, the people that say they have all the satellites and they monitor and look at things, um, from my perspective or our perspective, we, un unless you can actually travel outside of the planet yourself, 
um, we have to rely on information from scientists. And we rely on information that comes to us by the master teacher, Pana Bab Janun, Dr. Malachi Ziyu. He has never th taught us that the earth is flat. So um, people will say, okay, there's certain things we cannot prove because we haven't experienced them. But the way we deal with things is we compare the information that he's providing with everyone else on the planet that's providing information, not just on one thing, but on everything. And so if he has been right about, say, 90% of things, and he tells us information that's 10% that we can't prove, we are likely to say, well, everything else he has said is all right. So we wait till he clarifies it or give us information, but we would go with what he says. Now, other people can choose to go with whatever information they subscribe to, and that's, that's also fine. But then it's like he even says to us, if you don't know and have not experienced something, then you have to deal with it from a belief state because you haven't proven it to yourself. And he, and he says, I know you guys would like to just accept what I say because I've given you so much that is correct and you verified it, checked it out, and it's always been right. So you're, you're going to think the next thing I say is going to be right. But he encourages us never to accept or believe even him until we actually get confirmation. So um, as far as this flat earth theory is concerned, um, I've never heard him say that. He may do in the future or something may change, but until then, I don't subscribe to the flat earth and nor do the Wapians. All right, let's move on. Um, if non-melanated people did not come from melanated people, where did they come from? Who said they didn't come from melanated people? They did come from melanated people. That's the whole point. Um, and this melanin thing as well, it's also misconstrued a lot of the times. Everything has melanin. The difference is that you have people who are dominant, right? Melaninated people are more dominant in producing melanin. And others are recessive. They're losing their melanin or they don't produce it as much. This is the difference. It's not like... There's, everyone has melanin, like everyone and everything has oxygen and everything has ether. So um, melaninated people did come from, non-melaninated people did come from melaninated people. And another proof is Michael Jackson. You can see Michael Jackson went from a, a very dark person to a very light person and over time. And so that proves that... Uh, less melaninated person comes from a, a melanated person. So yeah, that, I don't know where, where you got that information from. Whoever says that melaninated people didn't come from, sorry, um, if non-melanated people didn't come from melaninated people, where did that come from? Because I've never heard of that. They did, to answer the question. Um, why is certain people on the planet resonate with sacred information and spiritual, or resonate, I guess they're trying to say. Why is it that certain people on the planet resonate with sacred information and spiritual knowledge and other people go with what they believe or seem to shut down any kind of facts? Um, to be honest, that's because of the programming life on this earthly plane is true for us. <coughs> Yeah, that's because um, when you've been told something for many, many years to believe, to believe, to believe, and you don't question it and you don't actually do your own research and you just accept what someone tells you, then if I can get you to believe something, and you do, I can get you to believe anything. So for many years, people were taught to believe because like, the people that controlled the information at that time, remember back in the day, you didn't have the internet you didn't have um, YouTube, you didn't have Facebook, you didn't, you, know, you didn't have Google. You didn't have certain things where you can go and check things out for yourself. So you kind of relied on the system that was in place. So if it was um, you know, through religion, because most people grew up in a household and were just taught that you came from God. God created everything and you went to, you know, to church and they taught you the same thing. You went to school and they taught you the same thing. And you didn't really have anywhere of um, checking it out or verifying it. Whereas today, 
Um, everyone has, you know, smartphones. Everyone has the opportunity. It's called the information age. So you can check things out. And that's what people do. And the minute... And also, it's in your DNA. It's programmed within you. So when things don't make sense, it doesn't sit well with you. So someone will tell you a story that you were created by God. But at the time, you're not allowed to ask questions. So you just took it and accepted it. But as you get older and you start to probe and ask people, who is this God? Where is God? If he created me, etc etc and they will tell you he's in heaven or Allah or Yahweh or Adonai or Shad, Shaddai all these terms but when you question things you get to the answer you get to the root that's what we're doing here we're answering questions and we're giving you information and you can go and research and check it out and let you be the judge of does it make sense because when you compare it to something that doesn't make sense or doesn't compute you can go, hmm, actually, no, nah, I'm going to go here. It's like if I have two people and I say, we're going to give one person facts and we're going to give one person belief. And, and I say to the pers one person, um, you know, you have to make things real. So, for example, if you had a health condition or, you know, you wanted to get a job, something that's important to you. Why is a job important to you? Because you're going to get money, you're going to get paid. So you want to know... When do I start? When do I finish? Um, how much holidays do I get? You know, um, what time do I come in? Um, what, what's the dress code? Um, when is the money in my bank account? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? How much is it? How much tax am I going to pay? You want to know all the details about your job because then it, you decide, do you want to take it or not? Um, and then if I do the same with somebody else and I just, just believe me, oh, don't worry, your money's going to be there when it's going to be there. Oh, it doesn't matter. I come in when you come in. Like, it, it's not the same. So, and it's the same with health. So, um, some people are happy being followers. Some people are leaders. And a lot of people are happy being consumers. And others are producers. So, you have to decide, are you the type of person that just wants to believe anything anybody tells you? Or do you want to know? Do you want to check it out for yourself? So yeah, the spiritual people, the people that really want to connect with the divine within them, they want to know what that is. What is it? How did it come about? And where's, what's it doing for me? Where is it going? So um, yeah, to answer that question, people that are gravitating more towards sacred information and spiritual information are people that want to know. And the people that believe are people that don't care about whether you can prove it or not. It's just someone told me a story and I just accept it. And you say, how do you know what the person that's telling you is true? They will, that person will tell you or somebody else told them. So it's just handed down for generations and generations and generations. Like Jesus is coming back to save you. And you can speak to people over thousands of years. They're telling you they've been waiting for Jesus to come back. And someone then says, you know what? Let's dissect this. Is he really coming back? If he's coming back, did he even exist? Where did he go? How did he get there? And um, when is he coming? Can I, I want to know date, time, place. What does it look like? How will I know it's him? Um, you know, so that's a factual person, somebody that wants to know, not believe. Yeah, so um, some people are gullible and some people are not. Does blood type have anything to do with your purpose on the planet? Can it describe where you come from? Yeah, blood type can describe where you come from because it's genetics and it ties into your ancestors and who you evolved from. Um, but in terms of your, your purpose on the planet, um, no, because you can have different blood types and people have different purposes. So, yeah, um, I would say know your, know your anatomy, know your blood type, know everything about yourself. But as far as your purpose is concerned, um, learn and get the information and it will come to you like you will work out what your purpose is by way of the, your knowledge but we know the purpose is truth to live truth to share that truth and to um, yeah to, to, to study and know what your potential is like find out your hidden potential and learn to become 
a supreme being again and learn to evolve to do great things and, and not be a number in a system. Will we see each other again? I miss my mum and other family members so much. Yes, you will. Um, we keep saying people don't die, they translate, they cross over, they basically go to a different realm of existence. And if you know how, you can communicate with them. And when you cross over, they're waiting for you to help you as your family bring you into their world where they are at the moment. So even within the realms of the physical, you have access to these other realms. Um, so you can communicate with your mom. You just go and know the signs and, and how to, to do it. And we teach this in Musabat, you know, through various rituals that we do. No rituals we do have anything to do with animals or human or any type of blood sacrifice. You know, we're just talking about natural methods of how you would communicate um, and, and com communicate with your ancestors. Okay. Um, I don't know how many more you want me to go on for. Keep going. Okay. What does it mean seeing black shadows? at the corner of your eyes. Um, that one is very open-ended. Um, I don't want to tell you because it could be different for everyone. It may be something wrong with your eyes. You may be personifying and seeing beings, entities that are around. We always say there are many types of beings around in different um, vibrational frequencies. You know, some people can see ghosts, people can see different types of beings. So that's very much a personal thing for you. Um, I can't tell you what exactly that is, but you know, as you study, as you learn, as you are able to digest what we teach in terms of, you know, dealing with all these types of different beings and extraterrestrials and different dimensions, um, you, you might come across the answer. I have a lot to learn, but I feel that why the master teacher could not save himself from those evil people. He taught so much like self-healing and more. Why not fight back? <laughs> he is fighting back. We're still fighting. Um, and when you say he could not save himself, he's still alive. So he's been saving himself. They've tried many times to abuse him and take his life if they could. So. It's, it's basically it's not past tense, it's current. This is still going. We've been fighting and still fighting for over 20 years for the injustice because, you know, when you start to look at the system and the legal, the whole legal system with regard to with his case, there's been so many foul play, um, evidence that's presented is ignored. So to answer your question, um, he's still alive. So when you say, couldn't, why couldn't he save himself? Um, also, we've broken down many times that he knows what we don't know and he's um, teaching us that it's not just him that is imprisoned. We are imprisoned because we're in the system too. And because they know that his information is the information to liberate the world. Yes, he's been sent specifically for, for us as Nuwapians, but... Anyone that wants to know the truth, he will share that truth. And so they, the, the powers that be or the system that is controlling everyone, the greedy people, the people that want to not let people know the truth, um, they obviously find him as a threat. So um, they want to suppress this information. They don't want it to get out. So, you know, and it's not just him. Anyone who's ever come and tried to liberate humanity and liberate the world and teach peace, love and, you know, let's kind of live in a more conducive way in terms of everyone um, love each other and work together. People like that, they threaten the, the, the people that are on the other side who want to control everyone and hide all the truth and just have you maimed and dumbed down to the point where you're just a consumer. You're just a person that just believes, you know, and they take advantage of you. So. 
Um, the fight is ongoing and if you do want to help and want to support, then check out freedoctoryork.com, come to our classes, read the scrolls, donate to the legal, donate to us so we can keep doing this work, um, subscribe so that we can get more people to view the channel and, you know, do your best to live truth. Um, the truth will prevail. The truth always wins. So if you're about humanity kind of evolving to the next level and stages, which is about having a peaceful world, a world where we can solve the problems that we're facing at the moment, then, you know, do your part. You know, um, everyone's got to do their part um, and fight back. Do Billy Carson teach the same things? Um, a lot of people try to teach what we teach and they'll have bits of information. Um, Bill, Billy Carson popped on the scene, to be honest, just recently. Um, if you go back to like 30, 40, 50 years ago, he wasn't around. So a lot of the information that he's teaching is actually regurgitating information that the master teacher Parnababianun, Dr. Malachi Z. York taught many years ago. And even people like Zacharias Sitchin was, were teaching this information about the Anunnaki. And he wrote books like Gen Genesis Revisited, um, many, many books. Just, just Google Zacharias Sitchin, you'll find out. So Billy Carson is not really teaching something new. Um, and he doesn't cover the full circumference of information. And I've heard him teach on certain things that are not accurate and mixes things up. So you have to do your own due, due diligence, um, you know, and, and then see for yourself because, you know, he's just popped up on the scene. And I've said before, he, he's not really a linguist to the level that, you know, he can speak languages fluently. So where is it's good information in terms of awakening and letting people know that, you know, the biblical stories and like what we teach um, are kind of like plagiarized versions and it goes back to people like Tahuti, he talks about the emerald tablets. Um, but like we've said, that same person he's talking about, Tahuti, is the, the person that Dr. Malachi Z. York is because that person reincarnates over time, over different generations and giving out information and teaching. So for someone that has knowledge on everything on the planet, um, that's who Tehuti was, um, Billy Carson only scratches the surface of that information. And like everybody else who's waking up from the religious world and knowing that there are things that, and cultures that existed way before Bible, Quran and Talmud and all these man-made books, um, that's going to be something people are going to gravitate to or be interested in. But yeah, he, he only takes you so far and he doesn't give you a full culture, you know, because um, a culture encompasses your dress code, your, your language, you know, the food you eat, the, the, the creative things you do. There's so much with your own scriptures, your own land, you know. So Bill Carson only gives you information and lots of people give you information. But do you build a culture and, a, and do you live it? Do you build communities and do the things that, you know, we've done and the master teacher has done? And that's where you find out that information is there. A lot of people teach information, but do you live it? Do you practice it? Do you put it into, you know, are you a sovereign nation? Are you able to take it from just information to actual practical application? It's great to know about the Anunnaki. It's great to know about all this information, but, but then what? You know, so there's a big disparity or big difference between us and what other people teach. Um, what does the Ankh represent and how did it come about? The Ankh represents, it's the key to life. Um, and it represents many, many things. It represents the birth cycle, represents the woman, um, as being the goddess, um, it represents so much, but it's really about um, the eternal life because people want to know the key to eternal life. Like people fear death because the religious world teaches you that death is the end. Like that's the final thing. And you either, <laughs> you either go to heaven or you're going to go to hell and be tortured forever. So the key to life as the ancient Egyptians, our ancestors taught, was no, it wasn't that, it wasn't the end of life. If you have the key, 
you know that there's existence after this one, but you have to prepare for it. And then if you make it, you can basically live another existence and then you keep moving on and moving on until you learn as much as you can about the universe, multiverse, the cosmos. Like there's so many different worlds and so many different things you can learn if you keep existing. However, if you don't, then you can get to a point where it is the end, but not the end in the terms of you're going to be tortured in hell and so on. So the ankh, as we, we say, um, leads you to the ankh-tui, yeah, because there is a double resurrection. Because when you wake up from being um, asleep, I can hear my other phone go. It doesn't matter if it's not bothering you. Yeah, so going back to the ankh, um, it takes you to a point and then there's more and the double resurrection which is what uh, ang tui means because you can wake up from being under the spell being in religion being in belief to knowing the truth and then from that what happens next this is what we go into in terms of you know you're now being raised to a supreme being peace what are your opinions thoughts on psychedelics mushrooms dmt lsd etc especially in relation to the raising of consciousness yeah, so again, what people try to do is induce um, having these experiences with, you know, psychedelics, mushrooms, etc., ayahuasca and all kinds of practices. Now, what we're saying is that because you've been maimed and we've explained about your barothrine gland being removed, um, the barothrine gland works with like your pineal gland and works with when you are able to basically reactivate yourself as a being, which is done by way of um, the knowledge, the things you do, your diet, etc. Um, you know, aligning your chakras, cleansing yourself. And what that does is this, um, what we call math cosette, it's known as monatomic gold, it's known as liquid gold, um, it's known as the elixir of life. Um, all of these practices were things that were done in order to turn you back into a supreme being because when you got maimed, you lost your higher senses or the ability to do certain things. The higher senses are intuition, clairvoyance, clairvoyance um, telepathy and psychometry. Now, so what people do is they try to like they, because remember the nerve endings of the barothrine gland were, were remained or they were left over because when you remove something and because you don't want to damage the basically the socket and the, what it was in, um, you, little bits were left. Um, people say, how do you know that the barothrine gland was removed or that it was even there or that it ever existed? Because when you, when you take a, a cut off the brain and you look at, you know, the different ways and the things that are in your brain. You see sockets and you can see that they've got things in them, right? And if you look at one that looked like another one, but something is missing, but you can see remnants of something that was there, you know that it was removed, right? It's like if I had balls in my hand and there was like different hands holding balls and, and you looked at one and there was a ball missing, but you could see the little bits and pieces that were left over on the ball, you're like, okay, someone's removed that. Um, I'm saying that to say that in order for you to become a supreme being and transform yourself, these things work together. So people are able to induce them with taking mushrooms and psychedelics and because what it is, is it's, it's um, relating to the hippocampus region of the brain in the cerebellum. And this is why when people smoke weed, etc., they say they're holding a the meds because what it does is it taps you into the realms that people are referring to as ethereal or spiritual or they can open up their third eye and see certain things. But you won't fully get that unless you have the real pure liquid gold or math cosette that we, that what we call math cosette. Um, we have a book on it, it's called the Elixir of Life. And this is what people are trying to find. They're trying to tap into, connect into those realms by using things like psychedelics, mushrooms, etc., and because it's a feel-good factor, um, that's why you know people smoke weed. But a lot of the weed and things that you're using, they're artificial, 
and some of them um, you mix other things with it and they're not authentic so you might have a little bit of an experience because you can still do it but without having any control over it you know there are people that can remote view but they can't control how to remote view they can't just go and look at places and go where they want to without knowing how to there are people that will experience um, interdimensional beings and certain things and some people will say you're crazy but what I'm basically saying is that you have to be careful what you're doing because if you don't know what you're doing or you're taking or using the wrong things you're not going to be able to do it and this is part of what we're being taught and it's best to be taught by somebody who knows how to give you back those powers without you actually causing yourself damage or you know, like the astral projection that we talk about. Some people astral project, but they don't know how to control it or how to get back, you know. So sometimes it can be dangerous. And then when you speak to people who are gurus or profess to be gurus um, and they're motivated by money, they will take your money, tell you they can do things and, you know, it, it cannot always work out for the best. So don't tamper with, take psychedelic drugs, mushrooms or anything without fully knowing what you're doing, because it can be dangerous. All right, so I hope that answered that question. Um, but yeah, it's all about trying to tap into to your etheric or your higher consciousness and your higher being. Um, so the ones we call gods or our creators they are technically advanced beings who know how to create life. So what created them? And what makes us so unique if we just an offspring? But that's what we're, we're explaining to people that you are gods too. Like just because you don't have the ability anymore, you don't know, you know who you are, where you, where you come from or how you got here, that it's easy for someone else to pass off themselves as God. So being God, um, there's different levels of God. This is why in the religious world, they try to say big G, small G and so on. But in the Hebrew or the language where they're translating from, there's no big G or small G. But what it is, is that you're, you are based on the level of information you have. You are then, what type of God are you? Do you know what I mean? Because um, if you don't know anything, anyone who knows more than you can be God over you because they can control you based on their information and they can then show you and do things that you look to them as being superior to you. But when you have the same level of information as them, they're no longer gods over you. So yeah, it is really about these beings have more information, they're more technically advanced. And in terms of offspring, yes, we have offspring, we're their offspring in terms of our ancestors. And so it's you're evolving to becoming them and they evolve into go to you know, higher levels of consciousness. So there are levels of what we're calling God. And you, know, you have to start from where you are. And then when, when somebody who's a God teaches you to be God, you become God. And then they move on, like I said, all the way to being a supreme being. So when they become a supreme being, they teach you how to be a supreme being. You see, so it's always about your constant growth and elevating and knowing more and the more information you have the more you should apply and the more you should utilize it not just for yourself but for humanity so yeah that question was um, right and exact uh, i can hear you upstairs okay um i'll do a couple more Thank you so much for giving us, the viewers, the opportunity to ask questions. I would like to know whether we are judged after death. If so, how? Through observation, I see the effects of um, what happens to a person who kills another human being, either by self-protection or murder. If we are judged after death, would the term justified be possible? Thank you for answering my questions and sharing the knowledge we all are in need of. Um, yes, the different levels of judgment or types of judgment. Um, the first one is to recognize that the highest beings 
who we refer to as the Natharu, they are the guardians and the overseers and they're very wise and they record everything everyone does um, by way of you yourself being a holographic computer. So everything you do is recorded in your matrix or in your DNA. And so you can't really hide. And religious, the religious world, they try to teach you that you get dipped in water or you, you, know, you, you take a shahada or you become born again and all your sins are forgiven. And then they also teach you that Jesus came and died for your sins. So it's almost like there should be no more sin in the world because if he came to remove the sin, why is there still sin in the world? So they give you a fictitious way of thinking that you get away with doing anything, which is not true. You judge yourself, number one, in the sense of what you do every day, the decisions you make and the things you do. And this is why we say that you have to live properly and you need the information. You need to know what's right and what's wrong. And this is the, the fear in the Bible when they were saying that if Adam and Eve ate the apple, they're going to, their eyes were going to be open and they're going to know right from wrong. Most people don't know what's right and wrong anymore. And man has taken it upon themselves to become the judge. Even though they will tell you in one breath, thou shalt not kill, in, as in the Ten Commandments. But then they will have you know, Supreme Court and they will have um, Crown Court, you know, where in America they can judge you and put you to death in the electric chair. So now a judge or a person becomes, you know, the judge over you. Um, even though they say thou shalt not kill, they can, they can sentence you to death. So um, judging yourself is number one in the things you do, but you can't know what to do if you don't have the correct information. This is where right knowledge, right wisdom and right understanding comes in. Because the Bible and the religion, they will tell you this is right, this is wrong, this is right, this is wrong. And a lot of it doesn't make sense. So then you don't know what you're doing. You, you, you're told, that, like I said, thou shalt not kill. But then people kill. You're told sin has been removed from the world, but people are sinning every day. So you decide whether you're going to put that bad food into your system whether you're going to smoke cigarettes, whether you're going to take alcohol to excessive amounts and it's going to affect your livers, your, you know, your body parts. So based on your lifestyle, you're actually judging yourself. Now, in terms of when you're dying and crossing over, if you haven't learned to rise and get your spiritual being to a higher level, then you're judging yourself because you have every tool and information to do what you need to do to elevate. So you will just come back. Our ancestors do not judge you in the sense of sending you to a hell where you're going to burn forever. But there are states of mind or states that you put yourself in based on your own judgment. So you can manifest and see all the things that you're scared of. You can be put through a situation where, um, you know, certain desires that you have that you haven't burnt out. So if you have an addiction to something, that can be a form of torture where you have to learn to control that instead of it controlling you. But in ancient times, when you're going through the journey of crossing over, you are tested to make sure that you've made the grade. This is where the whole ma'at um, thing comes from, where your, your deeds are weighed against um, the feather and your heart is weighed against a feather to see whether you have love, compassion, did you care about people, did you care about humanity, did you live a righteous life or did you live being a wicked evil person which will all be recorded in your matrix. So yes there is judgment but not in the sense that you're taught through the religious world but we have a book called um, The 24 Elders um, which goes into great detail on you know where you got the um, the negative confessions that they, you're, you're taught in, in ancient Egypt about the Ma'at and so on, those are all coming from um, our ancient culture of Wusabat. So yes, that's an excellent question. Um, I'm going to do one more. Do you study the law of one, the Ra material? Yes, um, ultimately that's what we call Pa'ut, 
Um, when you say the law of one, remember one is a number and you're talking in English. So, you know, if there's a one, there will be a two. So in English, um, it's basically oneness or as in we say all in English or the all. Um, but all is part in our language and it means where all is, everything is one. So in that regard, yes, um, when you say Ra material, Ra is, is relating to the sun, Ra, as in on the planet, Ra, which is the word used for the sun, um, means that without the sun, um, everything on the planet relies on the sun. Um, I know people are going to say there are beings that exist in the deep, deep waters, but I'm talking on, on the planet, um, and even without the sun, life will cease to exist. So, yes, in that sense, if that's what you mean, yes, sun, the sun is one, and um, all religious, whether it's Islam, Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Confucianism, whatever on the planet, with those people that are the head of those religions or the, the prophets or whatever that brought those religions, they all relied on the sun. So, yeah, in that sense, yes, we do deal with oneness, which is known as all or pa'ut, um, the all is pa pa ut, and um, the oneness is all. That's what we're trying to get back to ultimately. And there's also oneness as in the sun being that one being that um, basically gives us life on the planet. So I'm gonna I'm gonna yield right there. I think we've covered quite a few. Next week we will address the questions from today's video, and we hope um, you guys are gonna have some good questions for us. And um, yeah, tune back in next week. Okay, so um, as usual, we want to thank you all for participating. And um, the comments with the most likes are the ones we're going to address first next week. Because we can't actually cover all the comments and the questions. There's so many. So we have to um, have a system. And the system is the ones with the most likes will get addressed. So get your questions in early. Get your friends to like your questions. Get your friends to subscribe and we'll do our best to answer your question. Until next time, peace.